Welcome to St. Joseph's Episcopal Church in Salado, Texas. The scripture readings are for the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. The sermon was written by the Reverend David Hoster. We are a small church, but our doors are always open. Stop by and visit if you're in town. We'd love to meet you. As Psalm 133 states in part, Oh, how good and pleasant it is when brethren live together in unity. Part of our church mission statement focuses on worship, proclaiming the gospel, and promoting justice, peace, and love. We welcome all wherever they are in their faith journey. And we especially welcome you. The Collect. O oh Lord, make us have perpetual love and reverence for your holy name, for you never fail to help and govern those whom you have set upon the sure foundation of your loving kindness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from 1 Samuel 17, 57 and 18, 5, 10 through 16. On David's return from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. When David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that he was wearing and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. As a result, Saul set him over the army. And all the people, even the servants of Saul, approved. The next day, an evil spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre, and he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul threw the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. So Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand. And David marched out and came in leading the army. David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. When Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in awe of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, for it was he who marched out and came in leading them. The word of the Lord. Psalm 133. Oh, how good and pleasant it is when brethren live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head that runs down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, and runs down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the hills of Zion, for there the Lord has ordained the blessing 
life forevermore. A reading from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth 6, 1 through 13. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance, end afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and not yet killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark 4, 35 through 41. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe, and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of the Lord. This sermon was provided by the Reverend David Hoster. The story of David and Goliath is one of those moments that shows God hard at work. What's revealed in this story is that God cares far less about Israelite victory in battle then how that victory will be won. God turned out to be surprisingly unaligned with King Saul and Israel's military priorities. If God cared only about victory, 
he would have told Saul to act like Moses. You remember that story from Exodus? As long as Moses stood on the hilltop holding his staff over his head, the Israelite army won the battle. As soon as he got tired and let the staff down, the battle went the other way. 300 years later, however, times have changed. In the face of the technologically superior Philistines wielding iron swords against Israel's cheesy bronze weapons, the Israelites have cried out for a king to unite the tribes organize technological production, and create a trained standing army. They don't trust wacky prophets holding a staff over their heads anymore. The people have put their trust in political organization over inspiring religious leadership. Back in those tribal days, God had been their king, but now God had been shuttled to the margins though far from impotent, as we shall see. So, back to our story. As you know from last week's scripture reading, a chapter earlier, Saul, the first king of Israel, has already turned out to be a loser in God's eyes. This week, in, in this chapter, God turns his attention to his choice for the second king of Israel, David, the unlikely shepherd boy. How will he do things? What sort of a leader will he turn out to be? David was smart, and we modern technological types like that. He figured out that using a sling to put a rock halfway through Goliath's head made iron weapons and armor kind of irrelevant. We were all taught that was the point of the story in Sunday school, but it really isn't. More than being a good slinger, David has to step up for a suicide mission, walk out there unarmored and unprotected onto the bare ground between the two armies, go eyeball to eyeball without a middle linebacker twice his size, and infinitely meaner and somehow get off a one-shot kill before Goliath gets close enough to whack him in half with a quick swing of the sword. To walk onto that ground, David didn't have to be smart. He didn't even have to be courageous. He had to trust utterly in that power infinitely higher than his own. As David said to Saul, the Lord has saved me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the tiger. He will save me from this Philistine as well. That's what God was looking for. God wanted a king in Israel who wasn't concerned with power and victory, but rather with being the visible face of God's power in the critical moment when everything was on the line. That doesn't appeal to us modern types anymore than it appealed to Saul, or no doubt to his army, who must have thought their king had lost his mind, the equivalent of sending in the water boy to face the Green Bay Packers. Yet, what else would we expect of God, who is concerned that things be on earth the way they are in heaven? God wasn't angling for a trivial military victory. God wanted to find a king who could open up the chosen people's hearts, minds, and souls to power and glory on a divine scale. The water boy has the spiritual guts to trust God and bring down Goliath. That's a king who can take you to God. For the last couple hundred years, the world has been in transitional times just as profound as anything ancient Israel experienced. The Philistines forced Israel from the Bronze Age into the Iron Age, 
while we have gone from the age of swords into the nuclear age. Israel progressed from a scattered tribal society to a centralized state with a standing army, social classes, and an absolute monarch. We have shifted from a world ruled by the whim of royalty to a multi-class meritocracy with global industrial reach. Where 500 years ago God was king for us, as he was for tribal Israel, we must now ask what God is to us in this new world, a time not unlike Israel under its kings. The kings of Israel were notorious for using their power to ignore God. Like it or not, the thrust of modernism also pushes God to the margins. Science is our king. It seems that when the material culture of God's people leaps ahead, people's relationship with their God becomes stressed, sometimes even broken. What are we to make of the transitional time we occupy? Where are we and where is God? What can we learn from the experience of Saul, David, and Goliath? The ancient story tells us about a fundamental error religion can commit. We can choose Saul over David and decide that victory by any means, is what God wants. Historically, any means has included extreme violence, religious fanaticism, and prejudicial rejection of the basic facts of existence. In the 16th century, Catholics and Protestants slaughtered one another in the name of God with the same vehemence as Israelites and Philistines. The church anathematized Galileo in one century and Darwin in another. The recent round of culture wars in America is yet another iteration of the clash between religion and humanism dating back to Plymouth Rock. Well, when the church chooses to turn the instruments of intolerance and violence against its theological enemies, we choose Saul over David in the belief that God wants victory and doesn't care how it is achieved. If God's turn toward David means what it says, however, God cares far less about victory than about the good faith in the heart of the seemingly weakest combatant. God holds us responsible not for dominating our supposedly heathenish neighbors, but rather for living our own lives in the fullness of trust and spiritual integrity. Jesus didn't kill anybody. Rather, he awakened an entire world to the Holy Spirit. Everything that David represents, the weak but faithful and clever water boy, is what the church and the world need today. For the modern material world cries out like ancient Israel, for the God who has been left behind by progress. Without God, without some transcendent source for its values, the world of modern progress provides no basis for any truly moral society. We have learned that it's not enough for enlightened people just to be nice to each other. The ideal of modern secular moral progress died in the trenches of World War I, was buried beneath the threat of global thermonuclear war, leaving its grave to be danced on by terrorists, while it waits fatalistically for environmental catastrophe of its own making. Indeed, 
every threat to the modern world seems to drive it deeper into its own questionable morality. So scientific culture, like aggressive religion, has chosen the way of Saul and Goliath, and that's not good news. The instruments of Israel's Iron Age and the modern nuclear age put incredible power into the hands of people who are seduced by the newfound power into believing power itself is the source of their morality. Modern secular ideologies using the weapons of science have killed vastly more people than the church could ever have managed. The witness of the church is therefore vital in a way that it rarely has been in the past. Yet religion seems weak, pushed to the margins. The mere water boy, while generals and captains of industry our are a team. Yet the witness God requires of us is the witness of David, the water boy, not Saul and Goliath, the iron-armed warriors. I suspect that God cringes whenever the voice of the church is raised to strap on real, not spiritual weapons, and fight fire with fire in the trenches of the phony culture wars, moral combat. I suspect God's heart is cheered whenever faithful people dig down through all the confused morality of the times to find the quiet spiritual center of their own being where the moral compass points to true north. Like the Christ for whom we are named, Christians reveal their truth quietly, but persistently and wisely in a world that even now, can be called back to its own best angels. God is the God of David, not Saul or Goliath. We have many models for sound religious witness. The prophets of ancient Israel spoke truth to power at great personal risk. Jesus gave his life not to defeat Pilate and the chief priests, but to wake people up to the Holy Spirit that lives in every human heart. At its finest moments, the church has always called people back from the frenzying wielding of power by reminding them of their own heartfelt ideals. Today, opportunities abound for faithful Christians to speak the word of God sending well-placed words like stones to change minds rather than relying on iron arms and armor. These are not the times for Christians to be silent or to bury their talents. The biblical David does not represent passivity and non-action, but wise, courageous, and above all, faithful action based entirely on trust in God's higher power. We do not live in an age when Christians can take public morality for granted and sit shaking their heads at the bad news on the TV screen. We live in a fearfully changing age when the authentic voice of our God desperately needs to be heard. God is looking for new Davids to be that voice. Are you searching your spiritual depths to see where that voice lies within you? Thank you for joining with St. Joseph's Episcopal Church in Salado today for the 20th day of June 2021. As I always say, God loves you, and so do we. Until next time, be well, continue to pray for our country, and know that salvation is the greatest 
gift ever. 